So for those of you who are gone today, I'm going to pick up where we left off on Friday at chapter 25, page 119. If you guys remember, Jen had just stopped in and asked Luke to go to the rally, and he said no. Chapter 25, Luke lay awake the rest of the night. At first light, he got up and quietly scrubbed away the mud Jen had tracked in and up the stairs. Trust her not to think about mud. He fervently hoped she thought of all the details about the rally. Luke was just finished, finishing the last of the kitchen floor when he heard the toilet flushing upstairs. He hid the muddy rags in the trash and scrambled back to his place on the stairs, just in time to meet Mother coming down. Morning, early bird, she yawned. Where, um, were you up during the night? I thought I heard something. I had trouble sleeping, Luke said truthfully. Mother yawned again. And you're up early, feeling okay? Just hungry, Luke said. But he picked at his food. Everything he ate stuck to his throat. After the rest of his family left, he risked sneaking over and turning the radio on low. There were weather reports and commercials for soybean seeds and lots of music. Come on, come on, he muttered, keeping one eye on the side window watching for Dad. Finally, the radio announced the news. Someone's cattle had gotten out and caused a minor car wreck. Nobody hurt. A government spokesman predicted a poor planting season because of all the rain. Nothing about the rally. Dad came home, came back towards the house. Luke snapped off the radio and bolted for the stairs. At lunch, Dad forgot to turn the radio on, and Luke had to remind him. The announcer promised a big story after the commercials. His sandwich gone, Dad reached over it to turn the radio off. No, no, wait, Luke said. This might be interesting. Dad harumphed, but waited. The announcer came back. He cleared his throat and declared that new government statistics proved that last year's alfalfa harvest had set a record for the decade. It was like that for the day, for days. Luke kept waiting, desperate to hear anything, but the few times he could get to the radio, it said nothing. Every time Dad left the house for any length of time, Luke switched on the light back, the light by the back door, his old signal to Jen. He stared so hard, willing her answering light to go on, and that so that he could, that he thought he'd go blind. But there was nothing. He took to watching her house as obsessively as he had when he had first discovered her existence. There was no sign of her. The rest of her family came and went as usual. Did they look sadder, happier, worried, at peace? From a distance, he couldn't tell. He got so desperate, he asked Mother if she'd thought about going over to visit the new neighbors to welcome them to the area. She looked at him as if he were deranged. They'd been here for months. They're hardly new anymore. They're barons, she said. She laughed in that way that didn't hide her big bitterness. Believe me, they don't want us visiting. And what was she supposed to do? Say, nice to meet you. Now tell me everything about the child you never talk about. After a week, Luke did feel deranged. Every time everyone spoke to anyone spoke to him, he jumped. Mother asked him, are you all right? So many times he took to avoiding her, but he couldn't just sit in the attic waiting. He paced, he fidgeted, he chewed his fingernails. He came up with a plan. Chapter 26. Finally, finally, a week and a half after the rally, a day dawned that was so clear and dry, Luke knew Dad would be in the fields all day. Without hope, Luke turned on the light by the back door. After five minutes without a response, he turned it off and quietly slipped out the door. The cold air was a jolt, and for the briefest time he paused. This was more dangerous than ever. But I have to know, he muttered fiercely and crept alongside the barn before making his dash for Jen's house. He had to rip the screen and break the pane of one of the Talbot's windows, which he felt bad about, but it didn't matter. If Jen was there, she could think of an excuse. And if she wasn't, if she wasn't, he'd never be back at the Talbot's again. Once again, once inside, he knew he had to do something about the alarm quickly. Jen had explained it to him once, told him the exact sequence of buttons to hit to disable it. He ran to the hall closet, yanked open the door, and punched buttons quickly, afraid he'd forget the sequence if he hesitated even a second. Green, blue, yellow, green, blue, orange, red. The lights blinked out before he hit the last button, and that spooked him. Was that how it worked before? Hurry, hurry, he urged himself. The words kept replaying in his brain. Jen? He called, Jen? He went up and down the stairs, looking in every room. Jen, you don't have to hide. It's me, Luke. The house was enormous, three floors and a basement. He couldn't search everywhere, but if Jen was there, why would she hide? Against reason, he kept hoping she was. Jen, come on, this isn't funny. He found the bedroom, huge, 
elegant rooms with beautifully carved beds and long, mirrored closets. He couldn't even tell which one was Jen's. Finally, he admitted defeat and rushed down to the computer room. He hurried over to the keyboard and taped in the same sequence of letters he'd watched Jen type so many times. His fingers were clumsy, and he kept messing up. Finally, he got to the chat room password. F-E-R-E. -E. No. Erase. F-E-E-R. No. At last he got it. F-R-E-E. -E. Free. The screen went blank, with none of the friendly banter that had magically appeared every time he'd watched Jen. Had he done something wrong? Frantically, he exited and entered the chat room again, his hands shaking. Still, nothing. Timidly, using only his right index finger, he typed, Where's Jen? He had to hold one hand with the other to steady his fingers enough to hit the enter button. Almost instantaneously, his words vanished and reappeared at the top of the screen. He waited. Nothing. The screen stayed blank below his question. Because nobody was worse than... than because nothing was worth it, worse than doing nothing, he typed again, Hello? Is anyone there? Still nothing. He slammed his fist down on the computer desk so hard it hurt. I have to know, he shouted. Tell me. I can't go home until I know. He heard the door too late to react. When suddenly, a voice boomed behind him. Turn around slowly. I have a gun. Who are you? And why are you here? Chapter 27. Luke stifled his instinct to run. He turned around as slowly as he could. Guns had been outlawed for everyone but government officials long before he was born, but he recognized the object pointed at him from the books in Dad's description. Dad had always talked about hunting rifles and shotguns, big guns to bring down deer or wolves. This gun was smaller, meant to ki kill humans. All of that flashed through Luke's mind before he looked beyond the gun to the man holding it. He was tall and fleshy his expensive clothes only partially hiding his bulk. Luke had seen him only at a distance before. You're Jen's dad, he said. I didn't ask who I was, the man snapped. Who are you? Luke exhaled, exhaled slowly. A friend of Jen's, he said cautiously. Only because he was watching very, very closely did he see the man lower the gun by a fraction of an inch. Please, Luke said, I just want to know where she is. This time, the man clearly relaxed the gun hand. He circled around behind Jen and snapped off the computer. Jen says you have to Jen says you have to park the hard drive before you do that, Luke said. How do you know about Jen? The man asked. He narrowed his eyes. Luke blinked. The man was bargaining, he realized, offering to negotiate. He wanted something from Luke before he could tell he would tell Luke anything about Jen. But what? I'm a third child too, Luke said finally. The man's expression didn't change but Luke thought he saw a flicker of interest in his eyes. I'm a neighbor. I found out about her, and I started coming over when I could. How did you know she was here? The man said. I saw... Luke didn't want to get her in trouble. I saw the lights when I knew everyone was gone. I guess I, I really wanted there to be another third child for me to meet. So Jen was careless, the man said, with an edge in his voice that Luke didn't understand. No, Luke said uncertainly. She was... I was observant. <clears throat> The man nodded, only to accept Luke's answer. Then he sat down in the chair by the computer desk and rested the gun on his leg. Luke took that as a sign that the conversation might last long enough for him to find out something. Did Jen teach you how to disable our alarm system? The man asked. Luke saw no point in lying. Yes, but I must have screwed it up since you came. No, the man said. If you'd screwed it up, the security guards would have come. But I have it set so I'm automatically notified if the system shuts down while I'm away. Given the circumstances, I decided to investigate myself. Luke longed to ask what circumstances meant, but the man was already asking another question. So what else did you and do Jen do together? The man said. Luke couldn't understand why he sounded so accusatory. Nothing, Luke said. I mean, we talked a lot. She showed me the computer. She, she wanted me to go to the rally, but I was too scared. Too late, Luke thought to wonder if the man knew about the rally. Was Luke betraying Jen's confidence? But the man didn't seem surprised. He was studying Luke as intently as Luke had been studying him. Why didn't you stop her? The man asked. Stop Jen? That's like stopping the sun, Luke said. The man gave Luke the faintest of smiles, one of contained that contained no happiness. Just remember that, he said. So where is she? Luke asked. The man looked away. Jen's, his voice broke. Jen is no longer with us. She, she's dead, the man said harshly. Somehow, Luke had known without wanting to know. He still stumbled backwards in shock. He bumped into the couch and sagged into it. No, 
he said. Not Jen. No, you're lying. His ears roared. He thought crazy things. This is a dream, a nightmare. I will make myself wake up. He remembered Jen talking a mile a minute, gesturing wildly. How could she be dead? He tried to picture her lying still, not moving. Dead. It was impossible. The man was shaking his head helplessly. I'd give anything to have her back, he whispered. But it's true, I saw. They gave us, they gave us the body. Special privilege for a government official. His voice was so bitter, Luke could barely listen. And we couldn't even bury, it on her, bury her in the family plot. Couldn't take a bereavement day off work. Couldn't tell anyone why we were going around with red eyes and aching hearts, no. We just have to pretend to be the same old family of four we've always been. How? Luke asked. How did she die? He was thinking if the car had wrecked, it wouldn't be so bad. Or maybe it had nothing to do with the rally. Maybe she just got really sick. They shot her, Jen's father said. They shot all of them. All 40 kids at the rally, gunned down in front of the president's house. The blood flowed into the rose bushes, but they had the sidewalk scrubbed before the tourists came.